would like to welcome you all to this evening's lecture uh, as part of the 2023 Fall of the uh, River Lecture Series hosted by the Hudson River Maritime Museum and sponsored by Rondout Savings Bank. I'm Michael Porio, the Education Coordinator at the museum, and we also have uh, Stephanie Marinin, our, our great volunteer Leslie, and our Director of Education, Carrie Gallagher, um, and we're happy to be your hosts this evening. Before we begin, can I ask everyone to please silence your cell phones? Thank you. Uh, the Hutchin Maritime Museum is a 501c3 non-for-profit. You do not receive funds from the city, state, or federal government, except for some periodic project-based grants. Uh, we thank Rindout Savings Bank for their sponsorship of the lecture series. We also thank you for your contributions that help support the museum. If you have not already, please sign your name at the sign-up sheet we have in the front. There, you can also leave your email address if you wish to be contacted for future lectures and events at the museum. Uh, a few quick housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, please save any questions or comments you have for the end of tonight's lecture. We will leave time at the end for a quick Q&A. Um, for our virtual guests tonight, feel free to use the chat function to say hello and introduce yourselves and to send any questions that you wish to have answered during the Q&A later this evening. Now I would like to introduce tonight's guest, Daniel S. Levy, author of Manhattan Phoenix, The Great Fire of 1835 and the Emergence of New York. Uh, Daniel Levy is a senior writer for Life Books. He has written on such topics as World War I and Frank and the Civil War. Prior to that, he was a senior reporter at Time Magazine, where he covered architecture and classical music, and a reporter at People Magazine, where he wrote about social issues and crime. Thank you for being here, Daniel, and now I give the mic over to you. Hello. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I'm going to share my screen. I hope you've seen it. Hold on. Do you have it? Yep, it's great on our end. Let me just read it. You're on screen and your PowerPoint's on screen as well. So it's all good? Everything's great. Okay. So <clears throat> I was long interested in the history of New York. I'm a New York City kid. I grew up in the city. I went to New York University as an undergraduate. I studied American history. And a few things happened while I was a student there down in, in Greenwich Village. I became intrigued by the fact that there was a stream called the Minetta that was filled with trout that once flowed through Washington Square Park <clears throat> towards the Hudson River. And it actually still flows underground today. And at the time I took classes in uh, city history, New York architecture, and I was always sort of a bit of a street photographer, I was always walking around taking pictures. And I started taking pictures of buildings. And this is really, I guess, where my fascination by urban history began about how cities evolved and grew and maybe decayed. This, of course, is New York in the 1970s, back when um, President Ford reportedly said to New York to drop dead. And hopefully cities like New York then come back and were, were revived. I then went to... Um, Columbia University. Uh, I was planning to become an architect and a preservationist. And right before I started at Columbia, I got a job at Time Magazine. And when I graduated from Columbia, they made me the architecture and design reporter. And it really, it was really great because it really gave me a chance to sort of study my interests in, on a much, much larger international, I guess, scale. So my book, Manhattan Phoenix, really grew out of my love of my hometown and my fascination with how the place evolved and how it went from this wild island, which you see on the left, this is obviously a reconstruction to a modern city. And also I was interested in how there were still traces of the past, which you could still come across, such as this is um, St. Paul's uh, down on Fulton Street. Uh, it's an illustration probably from the late 18th, early 19th century. And of course, this is St. Paul's today. It's just two blocks from where the Trade Center um, is. And I really just grew to love the city, which I, as most New Yorkers, humbly refer to as the center of, of the known universe. So my book deals with the various forces that made the development of New York. And I was interested in this period from about 1825 up, up into and through the Civil War, which made the city possible. And all the different forces like water, and real estate and fire and land and how all the changes that took place during this quarter or 35 year period 
made possible modern New York and also made possible the consolidation of the five boroughs at the end of the century in 1898, which would be Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. And I wanted to tell this whole story against this backdrop of this forgotten cataclysmic event, which was the Great Fire of 1835, and not only the fire, but also the people who were there. So as I mentioned, New York was once a very wild place. Uh, this is a map actually from around the Civil War, but it shows the location of the streams and marshes and swamps and ponds in New York. Uh, New York actually, uh, before Hudson arrived, had about 66 miles worth of streams. There were ponds, hundreds of ponds, hundreds of springs. Um, and it was really, it was just a wild place. So, But you have to remember that New York's development, while it's this massive city nowadays, it was not really, was never preordained. New York in 1633, which is the year of this map, really only went up to 14th Street and New York was really only just, as I said, just part of Manhattan. The other, the other what we now know as boroughs, which is separate either towns or cities, what have you. And most people lived below 14th Street and the island was still covered with lots of farms. Uh, there were manor houses, the Stuyvesant family. You might know Peter Stuyvesant as the last governor general of New Amsterdam, because New York used to be Dutch. They owned quite a bit of land in what's now the East Village. Um, you had areas like, this is uh, modern day Foley Square. This is called the Collect Pond. It was covered about 80 acres. There was a massive hill next to it, which eventually when they drained the pond, they dumped the hill and other stuff in there. You might know Foley Square from episodes of Law and Order. Uh, that's where they're always going in and out of the courthouses there. Uh, this is uh, Lispinard's Meadow, which you might now know as Tribeca. Um, further uptown, you would have things like Marston's Creek, uh, which started about 79th Street and what's now Central Park and flowed into the Hudson River. Further uptown, you had um, Harlem Creek. It's about 120th Street and the whole series of hills in that area. So besides New York at the southern end of the island, there were lots of hamlets and villages throughout. Some of them you might know because the names have survived, places like Yorkville, Greenwich Village, um, Harlem. Others have been forgotten, sort of, you know, basically bulldozed over over the years as Odoville, Harsonville, Carmensville. As I said, there were lots of, besides farms, there were some manor houses. You had Aaron Burr's home on the top left, which was over on the Hudson River in uh, Greenwich Village. Uh, the Mineta flowed by and he actually dammed the Mineta uh, to build a small pond and his beloved daughter Theodosa liked to ice skate there in the winter. You have on the top right, you have Apthorpe Manor, which is about 91st and now Columbus Avenue. It sat on about 200 acres. And you have at the bottom, you have John James Audubon's home near where the George Washington Bridges, you might know Audubon as the naturalist who for all his wonderful illustrations of the birds of, of North America. Unfortunately, all these buildings are now gone. A few manor houses have thankfully survived. There's of course Gracie Mansion, the top left, which is now the mayor's residence. There's the Jamel Mansion, which dates from um, 1760s. It was briefly used by George Washington. Uh, at the start of the Revolutionary War before they fled to New Jersey. It was also briefly lived in by Aaron Burr when he was married to Madame Jamel, though the, this was the end of his life in the 1830s. It did not last. Bottom left, you have Hamilton's Grange, which is where Hamilton lived, unfortunately, briefly until he was killed by Burr. Um, it was recently moved to uh, City College uh, property in the 130s or so in, on the west side. And you have the Dykeman House, um, which dates from the 1780s. Uh, it still survived a Dutch-style farmhouse at about 204th Street and um, Broadway. So they wanted proper development, and a grid was actually laid out for New York in 1811. And it started on Houston Street. And at the time, it went up to only 155th Street because they figured no one would ever build anywhere near there. 
Um, and to give you a sense of how much they didn't think you would have that much development when they built a few years before that city hall, which is down below where the collect is, they only sheathed the south, west, and east side with marble. They put cheaper uh, brownstone on the north side, figuring no one would ever go around and look at that side. But as the city expanded, the hills, the streams, the marshes, the ponds were leveled, filled in. And the city really, in these early years of the 19th century, started to boom. In 1835, the population of New York was 268,000, which is double what it was in 1820. It was becoming a bustling place. You had lots of people selling things. You had shops, of course, with people selling things along the streets. You had oysters. You can There was something called the Canal Street Plan. You can get all you can eat of oysters for six cents. You had people selling oranges. There were people for shoe shines, bread, um, other things. And there were the famous hot corn girls who would sit down. Uh, they would sit alongside these boiling pots all day and just calling out, Here's your nice hot corn, smoking hot, smoking hot, just from the pot. So New York was thankfully blessed with a sprawling harbor and a river system. And it was really developing in the right place at the right time on the eastern seaboard. James Fenimore Cooper, who you might know for Last Mohican and his other great novels, moved to New York in 1822. And he noted at the time how, I'm going to quote, it's only necessary to sit down with a minute map of the country before you to perceive at a glance that nature herself has intended the island of Manhattan for the site of one of the greatest commercial towns in the world. And as Cooper then announced, the hour of this supremacy has arrived. Now, Cooper was quite prescient because just three years later, the Erie Canal opened and it basically linked the Great Lakes and the Hudson River and it helped really establish New York City and, and New York State as the economic center of the nation. And the canal became a real driving force for New York and is a sign of how it really spurred development in the first year in 1825 when the canal opened and ships, boats, I should say, not ships, boats started flowing back and forth. 500 commercial businesses opened in Manhattan alone. So Besides the Erie Canal, there were lots of other canals. This was an era of canals and development. There were roads, uh, canals going as far as Ohio. There were roads connecting to the hinterlands. Railroads had just started at this time. They were flowing into town. You have sloops and steamboats, uh, which were slipping up and down the East Coast and the Hudson East River and the intricate network of rivers and bays throughout so you have, at this point, city manufacturing, which is headed west and south and north. And meanwhile, you have southern and western and northern produce, which are flowing to Manhattan. Dock workers like these at South Street Seaport kept quite busy. They would transfer so uh, southern cotton and wheat there to European-bound goods, uh, ships, I should say. And the vessels then came back with finished British and continental uh, products. And of course, there was also the China trade. Uh, it was led by John Jacob Astor, who made actually his first fortune in fur. He found a ready market for it, not only in Europe, but in China, where he also sold opium. And he then returned with silks and porcelains and teas. And the city started to get a lot of very wealthy and powerful merchants. Um, two of the wealthiest were brothers. There's Arthur and Louis Tappan. They made a fortune in silk. Silk was actually once very big business. And they used a lot of their profits to uh, fund good causes. And one of the main ones that they were involved in was the fight against slavery. They started um, anti-abolitionist societies. So the population is growing. Uh, things are coming in. And immigrants is really sort of flowing into New York. And you start to really see this sort of juxtaposition of grinding poverty in places like the Five Points. There's an illustration of it on the right. And you can see a map on the left. You see these, these roads link up. There's five kind of points at which they link up. And so you had in, uh, extreme poverty in places like that. And you had also very tony, wealthy areas like Bowling Green. Bowling Green is, of course, still there down at the bottom of 
Broadway, just above the Battery. None of these buildings, of course, exist anymore. But you really see, at this point in New York, this really sort of the split between the best of times haves and the, I guess the worst of times have-nots between the politically sophisticated and the socially dispossessed. So, mind you, this is a beautiful illustration. Most of New York was not this pretty. Uh, the streets were actually quite filthy. There were lots of pigs and cattle and dogs and what have you on the streets. There were at the time in the late 1830s, I would say about 10,000 pigs on the streets. Charles Dickens, when he visited New York in 1842, was amazed at all the pigs. And he, he wrote he wrote in his American notes, take care of the pigs, which was basically watch out for the pigs because they could be quite aggressive. And as you can see, while people were not happy with the pigs, the pigs were in a way a godsend because they were one of the few reliable garbage disposal units. They went around eating garbage because there was horrible garbage collection um, and you had privies overflowing. The streets were quite filthy. And not surprising, disease was quite rampant. Uh, people suffered from yellow fever, from smallpox, from diphtheria, from scarlet fever, from measles. And doctors treated these with everything that they thought would cure people from bloodletting, which is basically opening up somebody's vein and draining out some blood, which they thought would return what they felt the humors in your body to some balance that would oftentimes would weaken you and kill you. They would rub the flesh with caustic uh, materials. They would have people drink mercury as a cure. They basically were prescribing what we would today call snake oil. And then in 1832, the city experienced for the first time cholera. Cholera had been around for centuries and centuries. It had not reached the New World until 1832. It was called the Blue Death because people would take on a bluish tinge to their flesh. And by the time it arrived in New York, it had already killed at that during that wave hundreds of thousands of people in 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 Europe. And there's you all appreciate living in this age of COVID. Uh, they did what many of us have done, which is either they hold up in their homes or they, else they fled the city if they could to uh, less populated areas. And in a few short months, just three months, cholera killed 3,513 people in New York, which might not sound like a lot, but that was 2% of the population at the time, which would be 166,000 people dying in the span of three months nowadays. But despite, you know, the filth and the disease, what have you, uh, the city development would not slow down and buildings were really rising at an exceptional rate. You had thousands of new buildings going up each year. Uh, the grandest at the time prior to 1833 was the Merchants Exchange. It was built by uh, Martin Thomas and Josiah Brady <clears throat> was on Wall Street. Um, and businessmen installed a grand statue of Alexander Hamilton, the first secretary of the treasury, inside the rotunda. Around the same time, Alexander Jackson Davis and Ithiel Town, who were two of the great architects of the period, started work on their customs house. It stood on the site where Federal Hall was, where George Washington took the first oath of office. You have to remember that New York was the first capital of the United States. And the building still has survived. Uh, you can go visit it. It's down right opposite the New York uh, Stock Exchange. And there's a statue of Washington out front, though the point at which he would have, the balcony where he would have been would have been about halfway up where that building is now. So there were lots of buildings going up, but there were very few fire codes. And this is, the pro one of the problems was there was still lots and lots of wooden buildings. You didn't really have modern construction at the time. Uh, there were huge fires all the time. One of the largest, most massive was set in 1776 at the start of the Revolutionary War, right after the British took over in New York. It was possibly set by a revolutionary. Uh, George Washington, when he saw when he saw it, wrote to his cousin that some either good fortune or some good patriot has started this. And it actually burnt about 500 buildings along the lower west side of New York. And there was actually another fire just two years later, somewhat mysterious, which burned even more buildings.
unfortunately, unlike nowadays, we have these great fire departments. Fire prevention was handled by a vast collection of volunteers, and these volunteers were I, were essentially really fraternal organizations. They didn't work in unity. They'd oftentimes fight with each other. They'd race to fires. They, excuse me, they, you have them here with horses. In the early days, they refused to use horses. They wanted to be manly and actually pull their engines through the streets. Oftentimes, if another fire company was running alongside them, they might start fighting with them. They would cover fire hydrants to prevent their <clears throat> competitors from getting there. And sometimes the buildings were burning. They were fighting to see who would get the right to um, put it out. Um, the engines were small things. They were about the size of an SUV. Uh, and they were based, they were, this is before steam power. They eventually got steam power, but they would have these large brakes, which they would have to pump up and down very fast. It was exhausting work. You can be knocked out in about two minutes and one of your colleagues would take over and he would do it for a few minutes and they keep switching off and it would send a spray oftentimes a kind of a weak spray at the buildings and um hopefully put it out but unfortunately fire spread and you would have fires with dozens upon dozens of buildings would be knocked out in no time um <clears throat> there was a reservoir um built in the 1820s i think it was mine just went blank it held about 200 or so thousand gallons was on 13th street they also would sometimes tap the rivers and cisterns, um, but there really was a major problem of not enough water. And this went on for years and years. There was a, there was a water company called Manhattan Com Company, which was started by Aaron Burr and his other friends back in 1798. But they were they really lousy supply because they were actually more interested in um, money exchanges because they had in their in their initial papers. They were allowed to trade money, and it eventually became what you now know as Chase Manhattan Bank, or now Morgan Guarantee and Trust, I guess. Uh, so you had this horrible problem, and finally in 1835, the city officials said, we have to do something about this. <clears throat> they decided they're going to build a proper aqueduct and try to get water from the Croton River upstate and bring it down, and a vote was, was held in April of 1835. And there was a majority said, yes, we want to do this and uh, let's build this thing. So this is 1835. This is the year of the Great Fire. The vote was, was of course, in April at the start of the year. So this is a view of uh, Lower Broadway. The church steeple you see on the right is the previous Trinity Church. It was built after the Revolutionary War fire. It lasted until the current Trinity Church went up in 1846. It is, so you're looking south on Broadway. Uh, the church is at the western end of Wall Street. This is the eastern end of Wall Street. Some merchant houses, warehouses, what have you. I think the it's somewhat fanciful. I don't know how many four or five story buildings there were at the time. Um, but this was this was Lower Manhattan. So you have 1835, they voted on building this aqueduct, and that winter got really cold, and December got especially cold, something we, I guess we can't appreciate having, I don't know about up where you are in Kingston, but this was the warmest winter I've remembered in years. It was so cold that the Erie Canal actually froze, and there were two major fires on the 14th, um, burnt a lot of buildings, and they basically drain the limited reservoir, the one you saw on 13th Street. It was especially cold on the night of December 16th and about 9 p.m. members of the city watch. The city watch uh, jobs were to go around to look for fires, to smell out fires and, you know, raise the alarm. They also uh, checked uh, cemeteries to make sure no one was stealing bodies. There was a problem of medical students back then uh, needing cadavers to work on and they would break into cemeteries and dig up bodies. There was actually a riot in the 1780, a resurrectionist riot about that. We have two members of the city watch. There was William Hayes and Peter Holmes. They were making the rounds. They smelled it and they found a fire burning at Comsock and Andrews, which was a dry goods store on Merchant Street. It was started, it was a gas fire that got started. 
And Hayes opened the door. He recalled how, quote, we found the whole interior of the building in flames from cellar to roof. I can tell you we shut the door mighty quick. So they raised the alarm. Meanwhile, there was a watchman in the cupola at City Hall who told the fire bell. And as the warning and other bells were rung, people took note and people started to rush there. One of the first people there was James Gullick. He was the um, fire chief, the head fire chief. And him and his crews rushed down to Merchant Street and they set up. They started to tap the local hydrants and um, tried to put out this fire, which was starting to spread. And Merchant Gabriel Disaway, who had a shop down there, he actually went into Comsec and Andrews with some others to try to save um, that business's stock. And he was horrified. He wrote how the fire burst from the doors and the windows on both streets. Firemen also went to the eastern edge of Wall Street to break through the ice. They actually pulled one of the engines onto the ice. They broke through and they stuck one of the hoses down. And then a whole string of hoses were snaked, attached and snaked down to Merchant Street. But it was so windy out that when the water finally was flowed, it sprayed this freezing water back into their faces. And soon Merchant Street which is one of the crooked streets in the Wall Street area, was ablaze. And it quickly spread to about five, 50 buildings. William Cullen Bryant, the great editor of the New York Evening Post, wrote, Never was there a more rapid extension of the flames. The stores on Pearl Street and on each side of Merchant Street were soon enveloped in the devouring element. In a few minutes, 20 windows of the upper stories of the high buildings on the east side of Pearl Street were in a blaze. Mayor Philip Hone, he was a mayor in the 1820s. He's best known for when being one of the great diarists of the uh, 19th century of New York. His store, his son, John, had a store down there. He just helped him set up a business, and he rushed down, and he was appalled by what he discovered writing the next morning in his diary, how the progress of the flames, like flashes of lightning, communicated in every direction. And a few minutes suffice to level the lofty edifices on every side. So businesses were burning. You had uh, Disaway was trying to save goods. Other merchants were rushing into their businesses to pull out what they can. And they were looking for safe places to store them. And one perceived safe spot was the South Dutch Reformed Church on Garden Street. So you have the church, at least an illustration of what they think it looked like. You'll see a very variation later. And there's a map showing about where the church was. And they thought this was safe because it had three or four foot thick stone walls. Just the way our merchant, meanwhile, climbed to the roof of a building on William Street. And he wrote how he saw a notion of fire, as it were, with roaring, rolling, burning waves surging onward and upward and spreading certain universal destruction. Tottering walls and falling chimneys with black smoke, hissing, crashing sounds on every side. It was especially dry out that season, uh, and the fire met little resistance. Of course, there were wooden buildings, which were just going up very quickly. It headed to Arthur Tappan's store. Arthur Tappan was the silk merchant abolitionist I mentioned earlier. He had his uh, granite, Face building built by Ithiel Town, who worked on the customs house. It was seen as safe, but he wasn't taking any chances. He had his crew go inside to save the good. At the same time, a lot of African Americans who heard that the philanthropist was trying to end slavery in America, his business was in danger. They rushed in to try to help them. Um, everybody carried the goods out into Hanover Square, but Tappan saw how fast the fire was spreading. And he wisely decided, let me move the stock to a friend's, another friend's warehouse. He actually moved it a second time before that. His shop, as I mentioned, uh, was on Hanover Square. Hanover Square, you could see here in lower Manhattan. It was about 60 feet wide and actually more than that. But before long, you had this uh, just filled and filled with goods from all the different merchants around there. You had marble top mahogany tables, sideboards, sofas, boxes of cutlery, crates of fine uh, French wine. As I said, there was soon a pile that's 60 feet wide. Unfortunately, everybody is frantic. They're trying to save their own goods. They're basically rushing through 
knocking over and trampling on other people's goods and destroying what's there. And then all of a sudden, a gust of flames was blown into the into the square and everything just went poof, burnt right up. <clears throat> By 10 p.m., the New York Herald wrote how the bells ringing, the fire engines rolling, the foreman bawling, the wind blowing, the snow driving, the whole heavens above illuminated form altogether a terrific spectacle. Unfortunately, this fire was out of control and they could not <clears throat> do anything about it. Uh, Chief Gullick had his men soak blankets to put on walls and windows to try to stop stuff. <clears throat> but pretty soon all the hoses were frozen like logs on the streets. And James Hamilton, he was the son of Alexander. He was the uh, U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, came down. He lived nearby at the city hotel. And he wrote how the ladders were frozen, the firemen were exhausted and demoralized. And soon the Dutch church, where people thought stuff was good, uh, started to burn. And as the church burned, it actually organ music started to waft, come out from the inside with the billowing smoke. There was a musician inside playing a funeral dirge. And he stayed in there until he realized the ceiling was about to collapse. And he rushed out and then the building <clears throat> was destroyed. The Journal of Commerce, which was one of the great, was started by uh, Lewis Tappan, was one of the great uh, business papers of the time. Its editor, Gerald Halleck, emptied his office. Uh, near his business uh, was the restaurant of <clears throat> Thomas Downing, a very successful African-American oysterman who had a very popular oyster house there <clears throat> on Broad Street. Downing actually found a number of hogsheads of vinegar, which hadn't frozen and with Halleck and others they got buckets and, and ladles what have you and they were throwing and spreading vinegar climbing up to the roof if they could to stop the fire and they actually saved their buildings and they prevented the fire from spreading either uh spreading further west <clears throat> so as i said one of the perceived safe spots was the dutch church which unfortunately burned <clears throat> another safe spot that they thought was the Merchants Exchange, which you saw earlier. <clears throat> it had a very cavernous interior, and people started to pile their goods inside the rotunda. But that building then caught on fire at about 11.30, and firemen uh, put it out. But then at 12.30, um, smoke could be seen pouring from the back. That's the building with the columns in the middle you'll see there. <clears throat> Um, as the building burned, some naval officer, a naval officer and some sailors rushed in the side to try to save that tall statue of Alexander Hamilton. They actually got it partly off its base, but then they realized the ceiling was about to collapse and they fled and <clears throat> the whole place was destroyed. The fire at this point <clears throat> was so intense that it was melting iron shutters, doors, copper roofs, gutters, you had molten metal, which is flowing off of buildings. And then all of a sudden, oh, sorry, there was the statue of Hamilton. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> there was a massive explosion that shook the ground, followed by more and more explosions. The warehouses along the East River, the, one of them, they stored things like saltpeter, and it exploded. And the blast continued for about half an hour. You have liquor casts exploding, barrels of gunpowder exploding. This is where it is. This is Coentus Slip, <clears throat> where it was all going on. So all along the Manhattan's shoreline, you have barrels of sperm and other oils igniting. One building actually blew up with such force that it sent burning timbers across the river to Brooklyn. Uh, thankfully, uh, didn't do much damage. The fire was put out. You, meanwhile, besides all this explosion, you have barrels of turpentine, which are spilling and contents of streaming like burning lava into the water. Meanwhile, you have people in Brooklyn and Staten Island who are watching <clears throat> this blaze. And it was so bright out that um, people in Philadelphia and New Haven were wondering why the sky was glowing. They had no idea that there was a fire <clears throat> hundred or so miles away. At about one in the morning, Chief Gullick on the left, Mayor Cornelius Lawrence and James Hamilton realized all they could do was really start to blow up buildings and hopefully create a fire break, uh, sort of clear an area where the fire wouldn't be able to, to burn and stop the fire. 
and Hamilton and others start to search shops for gunpowder. Meanwhile, the Army Corps of Engineers sent some New York American editor Charles King, who eventually became president of Columbia University, headed on a small rowboat up to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is the circle, my sad little circle in the top right. Um, also, uh, Army Lieutenant Robert Temple took a small boat to Governor's Island, and he actually found three or four hundred pound kegs of powder. They had discussed it extensively in 48 Exchange Place, was chosen as a building to blow up. Powder was brought into the cellar. Hamilton set up the fuse. Others ran a train of powder out uh, the door. Hamilton then went out with the others. He lit it. They went back. The building exploded, it actually rose from its foundation. But when it came back down, it fell into the building next to it and spread the fire into that. So they had to blow up the building next to that and other buildings. And thankfully, that explosion started to slow the fire. And Lawrence, King, Hamilton, others then looked for other buildings that needed to be destroyed. So by the early morning of December 17th, the seemingly relentless march of the fire had been stopped. And Hamilton, when he returned to his family at the City Hotel, he, he got into his parlor and he wrote how he collapsed. <clears throat> So in 2001, Osama bin Laden sent his planes into the World Trade Center. He destroyed, of course, the two towers. And that site was just a number of blocks away from where the Great Fire burned. On September 11th, 2,763 people were killed. Uh, the area of the Great Fire was thankfully escaped such a large death toll. Only a few people died. It was largely a business area and it was at night you have here this is the remains of the dutch church where the fellow was playing his organ um that's the remains of it um total of 674 buildings in an area which stretched from broad street um sorry from broad street to the east river and from wall street down to coentis slip was destroyed uh property loss was estimated to be about $20 million, which is about $600 million today. And to put that in some perspective, that was three times the cost of what it took to build the Erie Canal, which took eight years to build. New York uh, Herald editor James Gordon Bennett headed out that morning into what quickly became known as the Burnt District. And he soon after published a some 4,000 word piece on it, which was a form of reportage that New Yorkers or newspaper readers weren't really used to. He actually did sort of this on the scene reporting what he was seeing as he was walking around. He wrote about the devastation, about families, the few families that lived down there were wrapped in blankets, about merchants weeping, about their crews digging through rubble to try to salvage goods, others making bonfires with once valuable furniture to keep warm, and how the streets were littered with um, glowing burning bricks and toppled walls. Uh, Bennett, who only started his paper five months earlier and his paper would eventually become one of the most successful papers in the world, then went to great expense to not only publish a map of the uh, where the great fire burned, but also this illustration of the shells of the um, merchants exchange. Um, as, of course, of the remains of the Merchants Exchange, there was just cracked walls. Arthur Tappan's store, there was almost nothing left, just traces of it. And Bennett wrote how there was just, there was nothing but smoke and fire and dust. Mayor Hone's son, John's store, was destroyed. He wrote how he was basically fatigued in body, disturbed in mind. And many felt that this was the wrath of God, and people flocked to churches Others dug through piles to try to save goods. And quite a few people stole, and the jails actually filled with people. Uh, and the police, though, had to release them. Judges released them because they couldn't connect some of the goods with where they came from. The stock exchange suspended business for a few days. Uh, thankfully, fire companies from Brooklyn, from Newark, and elsewhere came to New York to help because the fire crews in New York were utterly exhausted. Mayor Lawrence... Uh, quickly summoned the Common Council and city leaders, and they decided to lobby 
the state and the federal government for help. Newspapers filled with lists of what was lost. You have here St. Stephen Whitney, who was probably second wealthiest man, to John Jacob Astor. He lost $500,000 in houses and real estate. Um, Nicholas Biddle, who was the president of the Second Bank of the United States, he arrived on the 19th to tour the Burnt District. He uh, offered the bank's help. The Treasury Department also instructed the Customs Department to give people who had bonds, who owed money on bonds, more time to pay them off. Albany, where Hone went to try to, try to get um, aid, authorized $6 million loan, which equals about $180 million today. And not surprisingly, the losses really taxed the insurance companies. There were 25 insurance companies in New York at the time. Most were local, they were small, and they were mostly local because there were rules against foreign uh, insurance companies. They didn't want out-of-state insurance companies taking away their business. Um, and they these 25 insurance companies were on the hook for about $7 million, which is about 210 today. Over half of them quickly became insolvent. One of the few that actually honored their policies was actually one of the foreign ones, which, which was the uh, Hartford Insurance Company. Elifal uh, Terry, who you see in the top left, he heard of the fire. He quickly pledged his own property as security. He hopped into a sled with one of his associates. They raced through the snow to the city and they set up shop and they started um, settling their claims. So you have to remember, this is 1835. There is at this point no Federal Reserve. There's no uniform currency. Banks could make their own currencies. Um, there was no FDIC to ensure what you had in the bank if it was lost. Uh, people started to rush to the bank to withdraw what they had. And there was a fear of real panic. But thankfully, rebuilding started quite quickly. Um, the day after the fire, Arthur Tappan, our silk merchant, ran a notice in the papers thanking God and his fellow citizens for all the help. He actually called a builder that day, made arrangements. They cleared the site. And in early 1836, just maybe half a year later, his new store opened up. Other stores quickly rose throughout the Burnt District. And Mary Sturgis, who lived down there, observed how the city was, quote, like a phoenix from her ashes. And despite all this devastation, real estate boomed. Um, 1836, which uh, June, which is just six months after the fire, the Dutch church, the place with the organ player, stood, it was an empty lot. It sold for which was then an astonishing $285,000. So by the fall of 1836, there was so much building that in a way the fire was becoming a memory and it was also the start of the sort of memorialization of the fire. You had a um, potter in England came up with a series of images and plates of the fire. This one shows the merchants exchange. You see the fire engines all around. They came in uh, blue and green and I think pink and yellow. A young Nathaniel Courier who would uh, join up with a fellow James Merritt Ives. You might know them as Curry and Ives. He started making illustrations and prints of the fire, which sold quite well. The Naples-born artist, Nicolino Caglio, you saw his image earlier of the fire seen from Brooklyn, produced a whole colorful series of colorful paintings. Uh, it's possible that Thomas Cole, the great Hudson River painter, took inspiration from the fire. He lived nearby on Late Street, which isn't that far from the fire. It's around where... I guess the Holland Tunnel uh, lets out in Manhattan now. But he possibly took inspiration from the fire to create destruction, which is the fourth part of his Course of Empire series about the rise and fall of empires. And the Hannington brothers, who had ran very popular dioramas in this age before movies, these were large, hundreds of foot long canvases. They were slowly unrolled with paintings on them, and there would be music and sound effects and light effects, what have you. Uh, by the middle of 1836, they had a one on the Great Fire, uh, which was quite popular. And they actually had pieces of the Hamilton statue, which was destroyed. They had that set up next to next to the canvases.
all the building was was going up and uh, small stores and businesses were being replaced by gleaming Greek revival structures. The building actually in the middle, the second one from the left, that's the old Assay office. Um, and so, of course, you have the Cousins House on the left, the Assay office. The facade was saved. You can go see it up at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the courtyard of the American Wing. They, they had saved it. And it's been there uh, since, I think, the 1920s. And now it's, they built a courtyard around it. Uh, but you have all these, you have businesses returning, banks, insurance companies, what have you. And businessmen resolved to rebuild the Merchants Exchange, one with Hamilton's statue. And a new Merchants Exchange went up in 1841. It was built by Isaiah Rogers, the great architect. He had recently built the Tremont Hotel in Boston, and he had just finished a hotel for John Jacob Astor further up Broadway. Uh, it was opened in 1841. You could see an illustration of it on the top left. The building still exists, though it's been added to, as you can see on the bottom right. It's 55 Wall Street. It was added to in the late 19th century by the great architects McKim, Mead, and White. Um, you used to be able to go in and easily see the great interior. It's now become a high-end catering wedding venue, so you have to be invited to go in. But hopefully you can. It's just quite, it's quite lovely inside. So this is New York in 1830s. Uh, it's bustling. And as you re might recall, I said at the beginning, New York which was just Manhattan, and not even all of it at this point, really went up to 14th Street. But there was so much development, great things like the Erie Canal and trade. Manufacturing was coming in, uh, and streets started to, the grid started to really take off. And the way it would be done, you'd, they'd oftentimes, since there were more uh, east-west streets because the city relied more on the rivers, east-west of the rivers, a street would be laid out in one shot and the avenues would be laid out maybe 10 blocks or so at a time as the streets were being made. And the streets were going up and businesses and homes and congregations were moving up and sometimes leapfrogging each other as they were looking for more and larger place places to build. And people were streaming and you had writers like Edgar Allan Poe. He lived for a while down uh, just below Washington Square Park. He eventually moved up in the 80s in the Bronx. He read uh, his Raven the first time it was ever uh, read in public at a soiree just off of Washington Square Park. You have Samuel Morse, who was a professor at New York University when he gave one of his earliest demonstrations of his telegraph. You have the New York Philharmonic, which started in 1842. Um, musicians were coming to the city and performing and finding places to perform. You have the great P.T. Barnum. Uh, he established his American Museum uh, on Lower Broadway. And he had many spurious uh, displays. Um, he, this is the guy who said there's a sucker born every minute. He claimed this thing at the bottom was the remains of a Fiji, beautiful Fiji mermaid, when in reality it was really just... Um, the torso and head of a monkey attached to a uh, fish, but people loved this. They went to see his stuff. The rich supported um, such high-end cultural institutions as the Astor Place op Opera House. They browsed in grand shops. They attended high-end theaters like the park. They dined in fine less restaurants and the burgeoning uh, working class uh, would go to music halls and oyster bars and the Bowery Theater. You have the Bowery Theater here on the right. That's actually, I think, the third the theater. The, the theater, like many other buildings, burned a lot. And from 18 mid-1820s to its final burning, I think 1915, there were actually five different theaters. Um, but change was really coming faster and faster with all this trade and what have you coming in. And the, in 1842, of course, the aqueduct, which the citizens voted on uh, in 1835, opened. And this finally brought a reliable and large supply of water to New York. <clears throat> it traveled a 40-mile route. They dammed uh, the Croton River, and they built this massive reservoir, and then, of course, this aqueduct which brought 
the water to the city and there was a main distributing uh, reservoir on 42nd and 5th Avenue. Of course, it doesn't exist anymore. The site is now occupied by the main branch of the New York Public Library, which you'll see on the bottom right. Um, at the same time, modern conveniences are arriving in the city. Uh, gas lighting is becoming available. Of course, people are getting water in their homes for the first time. They could have water closets, toilets, bathtubs, what have you, with, with water flowing into cooking stoves that did not rely on wood. New York's waterfront, meanwhile, was bustling with lots and lots of shipbuilding, especially along the lower East River. Um, in 1853, about 4,000 ships arrived in New York. By 1860, the city's port commanded three quarters of the America's ocean steam tonnage. Now, people forget with all this trade, New York was, besides the center of bringing in goods from Europe and Asia, what have you, New York was also a major player in the cotton trade. Uh, slavery was abolished. In New York in 1827, uh, though New York was still still very much the most southern of the northern states and cities, and some merchants made a lot of money off of cotton. Uh, it's been said that local merchants earned about 40 cent for every dollar spent on cotton. And to show you the sort of divisions within the city, there was actually a major riot against abolitionists in 1834 that lasted for about three days in the city. They went around pulling down black businesses and churches, attacking blacks in the streets. They destroyed Lewis Tappan's home, um, Lewis Arthur's brother, the abolitionist. They actually wanted to destroy Arthur Tappan's store. And Tappan had his uh, crew, his staff inside with like 30 muskets and gunpowder. And he's telling his men, aim, aim low and shoot them in the legs so they can't run. Um, but this went, this went on, of course, the city, you have to also remember that in <clears throat> the start of the Civil War, New York's uh, mayor, Fernando Wood, who had very close ties to the South, wanted New York to secede from the Union and join, uh, become a, a free and independent state. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, but streets are growing. Streets are being packed. You have Barnum's Museum behind you. By 1850, there were just hundreds upon hundreds of brokerage houses, insurance companies, banks, headquarters for steamships and mining, railroad companies. All these businesses needed uh, clerks and accountants and copyists. You had people like uh, young Walt Whitman coming in, he started uh, working in papers then. You had a young Mark Twain coming in at that point. Uh, businesses flourished uh, between 1840 and 1860. Investment in manufacturing actually increased by 550%. So many people were coming in, people wanted goods, and Alexander Stewart uh, had a revolutionary idea instead of these individual little shops which sold different things. <clears throat> he built the first department store. Uh, it's called the Marble Palace because it was sheathed in marble and it glowed when the sun hit it. It's offered everything from ribbons to you know diamond jewelry. Uh, he basically revolutionized shopping. Uh, the building is thankfully still there. Um, it's on Broadway and Chamber Street. You can go visit it. Uh, and those who could afford it spend lots of money on things, on fashion. And the town sort of brimmed with residents and tourists who came came down and spent hours walking along the streets. Some of them actually parked in their carriages and, and the merchants would bring out goods to them. They would go to shops like Lord and & Taylor and Brooks Brothers and Tiffany's. And of course, um, many of these businesses to make the stuff, they needed workers, they needed low paying workers. Immigrants uh, filled the bill. Uh, they came streaming in uh, and they would find work in construction and clothing production and as domestics. And the city population actually tripled, which at the time of the fire, I said it was 268,000. By the time of the Civil War, or just before the Civil War in 1860, it was 813,000. So you have all these people streaming in. The wealthy were looking for hotels, and hotels were opening like crazy, starting with the Astor House Hotel I mentioned. And many people 
really experience their first visiting the town. The first time they would see, you know, gas lighting or hot water or telegraphs or things like that. In 1853, the St. Nicholas Hotel opened. It was a grand place. It housed 800 people. It had frescoes and walnut wainscoting. There was a bridal chamber, lobby telegraph. Um, following year, there were actually listed 45 hotels in the city. <clears throat> All these people visiting wanted places to eat. 1846, there were 123 eating houses and refectories. There were grand places like Delmonico's. Of course, the Delmonico's is still around. Though I heard recently they might be partly closed because of COVID. I'm not sure. The business. Places like Taylor's and Thompson's Saloon. Taylor's was very popular, uh, had a very um, female clientele. Uh, and they loved the marble floor tiles, the um, gold upholstered chairs, the frescoes. There were actually two grand conservatories in there. <clears throat> there were, as I mentioned earlier, the six cent all you can eat oysters on the street, but there were also lots and lots of oyster places and oyster cellars. The grandest, of course, was Thomas Downing's, our African American oyster, oyster man. He made quite a fortune and invested quite profitably in real estate. Um, so the city is really booming and expanding. And as is expanding, people are starting to bemoan the fact that some older buildings, some landmarks were being quickly demolished. One of them was the Sugar House. It was a warehouse where during the revolution, the British uh, pr imprisoned many uh, American soldiers in very squalid conditions. These places were being just knocked down and the streets and avenues were being cut through. And the streets and avenues, basically you had this grid which did not turn, except for Broadway, which was the one Main Street, which was allowed to continue its rambling way across the island, everything was was like drafting, you know, rulers just straight, and it oftentimes streets were were dug out and buildings were left uh, up on hills. Some of them were then demolished or moved. The building on the top was actually Brennan's farmhouse. It's on was was on eighty fourth. On the west side, Edgar Allan Poe briefly lived there. I think he soon after moved up to the Bronx. The scene you see on the bottom is um, Second Avenue and Forty um, Second Street. Um, you have grand estates. Remember, I showed you all those farms and estates earlier. Um, <clears throat> Clement Clark Moore, who you might know him for his poem "Twas a Night Before Christmas," wall through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. He had 94 acres in what is now Chelsea. The area was named by his grandfather. He was actually initially opposed to development and actually wrote a, a screed against it. But then he realized there was lots of money to be made. And he, he set up sort of architectural covenants for the streets and helped um, row houses uh, be built in, in Chelsea. And many of them have thankfully survived. So as the rich were moving north, they were building grander and grander buildings and styles evolved. And also you have architects were streaming in, not only from the US, but also from Europe and styles started to really evolve. Of course, you early had the Greek revival, which were those temple type fronted buildings. But all of a sudden you just, the city was like this potpourri of a mixture of, of styles. You have the Astor Library, which was the first public library in the United States. It was built by Alexander Salzer in the Rundbogenstiel, the round arch style. It was added on, the library expanded to the um, south and north. Uh, the building still survives. It's the public theater. You can go visit it down on Lafayette Place. You had places like um, this Anglo-Italianate cotton exchange on the top left, which is still around. It's now Harry's. It's a very nice slightly pricey restaurant. Um, there's a Greek, uh, sorry, Egyptian revival uh, prison called the Tombs, uh, which was built where the collect uh, was that pond I mentioned. Uh, that's no longer around, but then you have um, an armory, 
in a Gothic revival style, which is still around um, in Central Park along Fifth Avenue. Not all of it was pretty and beautiful as this. There was lots of squalor and slums because the city was developing fast and there was not enough places. And if people just, you know, doubling up and tripling up, what have you, in, in apartments and buildings, larger houses when the rich moved out were then converted into boarding houses. This is a shanty town called Dutch Hill. It's on 3rd Avenue and 42nd Street. You also have, um, at this point, some architectural developments were taken off. One of them, which was the main one, which was the development of cast iron by James Borgatus in 1848. And you were able to make, instead of having to carve elements out of stone, you could cast them out of iron. And they basically would cast all these pieces, cart them over to the site, and then bolt them together and much more quickly uh, build buildings. And you have businesses which were booming um, architectural works, iron works along the rivers. The biggest employer was probably the novelty iron works. They employed <clears throat> some 1,000 people. And by 1860, there were actually 539 iron works in the city. They employed about 10,000 workers. You can actually start to see the real transformation of the city at this point in the houses of worship. So you remember our Dutch church where the organist was playing. It was destroyed in 1835. <clears throat> the congregation split. Part of it settled on Washington Square on the east side in a uh, Gothic revival church by Menard Lefervre. Unfortunately, no longer exists. It was on the southeast side of the park. Uh, some of Lefebvre's buildings still do, of course, survive. You have his Sailor Snug Harbor complex out on Staten Island, which you could visit. <clears throat> the Unitarians, um, they grew, they outgrew their church, the Divine Unity. In 1835, they had Jacob Ray Mole designed for them the All Souls Unitarian Church. It was a Lombard Romanesque style building. It was sheathed in yellow stone and red brick. It was quite beautiful, but unfortunately it got the nickname of the Church of the Holy Zebra that unfortunately no longer exists. The old St. Patrick's Cathedral, which was built in 1815 by um, Mangin, uh, Jacob Mangin, who uh, co-built the city hall. It still exists if you go down to Mulberry Street, <clears throat> but the Catholic population had been growing leaps and bounds and Bishop Hughes wanted to build a grand cathedral. And of course, James Renwick built his St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue and 50th Street, which is still there. Um, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous building you should visit. So by the eve of the Civil War, you have houses lining, stretching up the island. This is a map that gives you an idea of, loose idea of the extent of development, you know, from 1811 to 1836, 1840, 54. 1862. So you have buildings which are up to about 60th Street, maybe four miles from where the Great Fire um, burned. Um, unfortunately, when they laid out the grid, this grid in 1811, they figured the city would not develop that fast. And they had these two large rivers. We don't need parks. And in 1811, they only set aside 470 acres for parkland. And as the city was developing, many of those parks were uh, reduced in size or just never built. And this phenomenal growth by the 1850s made the city leaders really worry for what the New York Mirror wanted to restore, what was called the lungs of the city. And thankfully, uh, in the mid 1850s, they decided they had to set aside land. There was a d debate over where it should be. One of them was on the east side in the 60s and 70s, an area called Jones Wood, which covered about 160 acres. The Jones and the Skirmahorn family refused to sell it. And eventually they decided on a more central and much larger site uh, in the center of the island, became known as Central Park. And it was designed, sorry, this is the map. It was designed by um, Calvert Vaux on the left and Frederick Law Olmsted on the right. Um, this is work was started in the late 1850s 
right at the time there was a panic, a huge depression in the 1857. They were one of the largest um, employers in the city. Thousands upon thousands of people were employed to basically turn this area, this rocky area into, into a park, um, a sort of permanent retreat for all New Yorkers. And all the forces which really transformed the city in this whole period leading up to the Civil War got leaders like Andrew Haswell Green, who oversaw the, the creation of Central Park to start developing the area above 155th Street. Because remember, the 1811 grid only went up to 155th and they realized we're still going to outstrip it. And they laid out further part of Manhattan, but they also started covetously eyeing the surrounding area. And in 1898, uh, Green and others helped bring about the consolidation of what is now Greater New York, the five boroughs of New York. And the city was still, and is still a place of frenetic activity. It's a grand metropolis, which is seemingly never, never at peace. Thank you. So we're just going to pass the microphone around to anyone who has questions, Dan. Hopefully, hopefully I can answer them. All right. And uh, any of our, our virtual guests, if you have a question, just either leave the question in the chat or just say in the chat that you have a question and we'll make sure we get to you as well. I see a hand. Where is Merchant Street downtown? Merchant Street, just off Wall Street, uh, downtown. Um, let me try to get back up. It doesn't really exist anymore. So it's just this area. Sorry. You have Wall Exchange Place. If you look at this map, um, so that's the Dutch church on the top. And if you look further down in the middle, there's Merchant Street. It became known as Garden Street at a point also. So it's exchanged. So the streets were, some of them were destroyed. They I laid see. out. There was actually a move to uh, try to make it less of a web of streets down there. Um, Ithiel Town, the architect I mentioned earlier, he did the um, Customs House and uh, Tappan's original granite building. Uh, he actually uh, proposed uh, widening a lot of the streets and filling in some of the keys and stuff. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, but the city did do did do some some rearranging of the streets. They also started early uh, building codes um, because they realized they had there, there were problems. The problem is that oftentimes people did not always follow the building codes, and um, it's really not until later in the nineteenth century where you have better construction because a lot of these buildings really went up very fast, and there really weren't wasn't much oversight in buildings. There was always a problem of buildings actually sometimes collapsing. At the start of the panic of 1837, um, one of the major cotton traders in the city, they were building a new building and they it was really cold out and some of the joinery work would have in the back wasn't done right and it just cracked and five-story building just collapsed. Okay, very interesting. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Three years ago, I used to work down there, and that street name just doesn't ring a bell in my head. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't work there that long ago. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? My question has to do um, right after the fire, whether or not it was the government that organized groups to clear away the debris or whether these groups were volunteer groups. And then the second part of my question is where was the debris delivered? What happened to it? It was dumped in the water mostly. It was dumped in the water, it was probably used as landfill. Uh, don't forget at this point, they're trying to level out the island, so they're probably using it for that. Most of the construction, reconstruction, clearing was really privately done. I'm sure there was some government assistance, but most of it, you had basically had the businessmen that had to do it. Um, and they had crews. They probably didn't pay them that well, but they they got their work done. Um, 
but yes, yeah, some of it there was there were still you know you, you have to remember there was you know the city still had streams and waterways you know Broad Street which we know now is this wide street, um, not that long well hundred years earlier was actually still a, a canal, um, I think it was actually no it may have been filled in in, in the late seventeenth century, it was called um, Hergracht. Uh, gentleman's Canal for the Dutch. Beaver Street was uh, Prince Gracht, which was Prince Canal. Um, so there was a slow process of using, they would do stuff to just fill stuff in. And also, you have to remember the shoreline of Manhattan, I think you might see it on this early map. Forgive me. Um, no, not there. There, whoops, there we go. If you look at this map, look at on the left side, which is the southern part of Manhattan, there's green and you see all around it the brown. That's all landfill. There was a process over the years and years of people wanted more land. They built them out. Faneuil Hall, not Faneuil Hall, um, Francis's Tavern, Faneuil Hall is Boston, sorry. Francis's Tavern used to be on the water. It's now two blocks in. Uh, Water Street, uh, Pearl Street was actually originally the shoreline, uh, then became um, Front Street, because it was on the front on the water, eventually was South Street. And they would they would do this development. There was this process they sometimes would use debris. They sometimes would take old disused ships and scuttle them and fill them in around there. And I remember back in the 80s, uh, when I was young, I, I did some work on, I wanted to minor work at that, oh, the Square Riggers down at South Street. I remember around this time, they were restoring some of the buildings of the, the museum's buildings on Front Street, and they found below it a, a ship, which had been scuttled. Um, this was a big process. San Francisco had a tremendous amount of this. People would rush out there in the during the gold rush, and uh, you have they would run from the boats to find gold, and crews would abandon the boats, and the boats became disused. And at one point, you had hundreds of abandoned ships in the harbor, which eventually were just scuttled. There was actually a ship named in honor of Philip Hone, uh, which generally worked on the South American trade. And at one point, it went up around the Horn up to San Francisco, and it was abandoned in the harbor. And eventually, it was used as a storehouse for a while and eventually scuttled. And now there's a coffee shop. On top of where it was, I went. I went to have it and pay my respects to the, to the Bach Philip home. Um, so yeah, they 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 may do. Thank you. Any questions in the chat? Sure. Uh, could, could you tell us when? Uh, pay, you said these fire departments were all volunteer. When did they start to get regular? paid fire departments in New York City like we know them today? 1865, end of the Civil War. Um, the, for decades and decades, people were very frustrated with the fire department. <clears throat> James Gordon Bennett uh, railed against them. I think at one point he said the firemen, these, these dogs, should be, they should be shot in the street like dogs, wild dogs. Um, some of them loved the firemen because they were the, these, these, you know, manly men, you know, this great, you, you see Whitman writing about them who, who risked their lives and did these daring things. But it was just an unruly bunch. You know, um, Boris Tweed, William Tweed actually um, ran, headed up a fire department. That's how he eventually got into politics. And he eventually was uh, suspended from it because he was fighting against another fire company throwing, you know, what they said were missiles and other things at this fire company. So they finally, in 1865, decided they had to have a, a proper fire department. Uh, we didn't have a proper police department until I think the 1850s or so, before they had city watches and stuff. Um, and policemen didn't actually always work along with each other because before they were paid a salary, they would sometimes get rewards for recovering goods. So they would keep stuff secret so they wouldn't have to share it with their colleagues. Um, it was really the Wild East back then, and the fire department were really a bunch of bruisers. Um, and eventually, you know, they they thankfully 
created a, a unified fire department and much and they you know they resisted things like um using horses as i mentioned they they said it was not manly to use a horse and it was it, you finally had them starting to use horses during the cholera plague because they so many of the men were out sick or dead um and it was finally in the 1850s where they started to get some more of these regulations and of course 1865 the fire company the modern more modern fire company came into being anything else all right i think all right, and uh, to answer Robert's question in the chat, the uh, recording of this will be on our YouTube uh, next Wednesday at Hutch River Maritime Museum. The best way to not miss it is to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, so that's it for questions. I, I guess I'll just give a quick closing remarks. So if you could stop sharing your screen, please, Dan. Stop sharing. I know it's tough to give these presentations without being able to see the audience or give any, get any audience feedback, but... I can assure you, all of us here were raptured. Thank you. So, everybody, um, that's it for tonight. Thank you uh, a lot, D Daniel, for giving us a presentation. That was really fascinating. Um, we have copies of, of Dan's book are on sale here at the museum. Um, really, really painstaking use of primary sources. Really, really great book. I recommend it. And, um, to everyone in uh, all of our, our virtual audience, um, if you would like a copy, just uh, email us at education at HRMM or just come to the museum. Um, yeah, so just quick closing remarks. Uh, that looks like all the time we have for now. <laughs> if you have any additional questions, you can email us at education at HRMM in the chat. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel, for joining thank us. Um, and just a reminder that we do have Daniel's book available for sale tonight. Um, our next lecture will be a uh, hybrid virtual and in person with Justin, Justin Wexler on March 8th. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, one more question. That sign in back of your head, is that Beach 99th Street? Say again? <clears throat> can, can you turn around over your right shoulder? And what's that? Beach 99th, Beach 99th Street. Street. Uh, they, they, were, they, were, they were demolishing um, back in the 80s, I guess, Rockaway Playland. And that was one of the, it was in a garbage heap. The one right. you see over here. Uh, huh. So you now have green signs. New York used to have, back in the 60s, you might recall, each borough had its own color sign. Before that, you had these blue signs. Um, yeah. Where they would show the Main Street and the Cross Street, what have you. So um, I have a few of those and other stuff which I've just gathered. Okay. It's used to be my daughter's room, so that's why you'll see you'll see um, planets on the ceiling and stuff like that okay. and spaceships. <laughs> she now studies astrophysics, so I guess it paid off. Oh, good, good. But the Beach 99th Street sign, it's not far from the Irish Circle. Not far from where? The Irish Circle. I don't know that. The bar down there. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Well, I promised you, Daniel, that you wouldn't have any uh, shortage of questions. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming tonight. Um, our next lecture will be March 8th. It'll be with Justin Wexner. It'll be The Bitter Farewell, the Asopas Indian Experience in the American Revolution. So we hope to see you there as well.